Well, some of you see this little bed back here. That's, that's not for me to lie on. Uh, Pastor Doug gave you a little bit of a clue uh, where we're headed. And uh, the four pillars, which is uh, part of the title of the message today. So we'll talk about that. Uh, before we go to our scripture, if you want to take out your Bible or the church Bible, we'll go to Hebrews chapter 4, but you can listen while you do that. Um, I, I want to acknowledge our property committee folks, uh, Brandon Osterink, a headset up, along with Keith Nykamp, our two deacons. Uh, but in a special way today, I just want to say thanks to Wayne Osterink and to Larry Booby, who spent a lot of time here this past week. Uh, they're not looking for any credit or kudos in this um, they are trying to help us deal with the sound problem, the, the bouncing around of the sound in the ark. Uh, any of you who have been up there for a funeral luncheon or another gathering in the past or even last Sunday night as we had our first Jesus and You class know that it gets difficult to hear each other because of the acoustics in that room. Uh, this is the north side room. Uh, they, they gave uh, a lot of their time this week putting up sound panels to absorb the sound. So uh, don't let that be something that keeps you away from the class if you're a part of that tonight. Uh, I don't know if it's completely fixed, but it's got to be much, much better. So I thank the Lord for these guys that give of themselves day after day uh, and praise the Lord. So yeah. All right. Hebrews chapter 4. Page 1865, if you're using the church Bible, we'll read this entire chapter, thinking about a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from all his work, and again in the passage above he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David and was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken, spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Thanks be to God. What would you say you are building your life on today? What are you building your life on? And what will we build the future ministry of Forest Grove Reformed Church upon? Very important questions for us to think about. Because if we are building on the wrong foundation or with the wrong materials, we're going to end up with a mess. 
Every builder, and we have a number of them here in our congregation, know that when you set out to build a home, to build a business, a, a building of any kind, you sit down and you consider the cost, right? You consider uh, the materials that are needed. You certainly think about the structural plans that will be in, in place for that building to become a reality. Friends, you and I, as followers of the Lord, are not only building our lives, we are also building the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. One goes hand in hand with the other. So goes the member, so goes the church. We have this incredibly good news to hear and to savor uh, from the lips of Jesus Christ this morning that he is building his church. Remember that in Matthew 16, 18, he was speaking to Peter, but really speaking to all of his disciples. Uh, he said, uh, I call you Peter, and I tell you that on this rock, meaning not Peter himself, but on Peter's confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That's a great promise. That same apostle, Peter, wrote later in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. Paul talked about it as well in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, that we are God's building. But Peter and Paul and you and I are not only the building of God, we are an important part of the building process. Because God, Christ, is building his church in us and through us. It's both. We're the living materials, the living stones, but we're also the tools of God for that building. It's kind of an amazing thing to look at. Did you know that one of the most quoted verses from the Old Testament in the New Testament is Psalm 118.22? which says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Some versions say the capstone. That's quoted at least five times in the New Testament that I could find. What's significant about that verse is that it refers to the Jews as builders, right? They're builders, just like we are today. But it says that they rejected the most important building material of all, the cornerstone, the foundation upon which everything else is built and designed to rest. The cornerstone affects the character of the whole thing, the integrity of everything else in the building. And friends, Jesus is the only true cornerstone for your life. If you try to build your life on money, the acquisition of money or possessions, if you try to build it on your profession or on a human relationship, be it a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever, or anything else, you run the risk of your life falling apart when the storms and the winds and the waves of trouble and grief and, and overwhelming life stuff comes upon you. Our closing song will remind us that all other ground beside Jesus Christ is sinking sand. It's not a rock. It's sinking. And as our first songs reminded us that Jesus Christ is the one foundation of the church. He is the cornerstone. Forest Grove Reformed Church was built 148 years ago, is it now? We're just a year and a half away from our 150th anniversary celebration. It was built on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the future of Forest Grove Reformed Church must continue to be built on that same person and work. St. Paul declares no other foundation can one lay than that which is already laid, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So may God help us, each and every one, and collectively to make absolutely certain as we go forward together in ministry that we do everything uh, centered around and for the purpose of honoring and exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, bringing people to him. To help us do that, I want to point out four things that we see in Hebrews chapter 4 that provide solid pillars for our faith and for our corporate ministry. Each one of these four pillars is absolutely indispensable to living the Christian life successfully. Being the kind of church that honors the Lord, honors his name, the beautiful name, the powerful name of Jesus, and advances his kingdom, builds his church on the earth. We could look at each of these pillars uh, with probably a month of Sundays of sermons, but we want to just do a quick overview of them this morning. So number one, let me start on the far side here, is the Word of God. The Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. We look at verse 12, which even though it's in the middle of the chapter, is the place that I want to begin because it seems so crucial, so central to everything. The Word of God, it says, is living and it's active. There is no book in the world, friends, like the Word of God. It has stood the tests of time. It has changed the course of human history. It's living and it's active because it was written by God himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. God breathed into the apostles, into the prophets, as his very scribes, to move the pen, to say the words, to put the ideas into written print for your sake and mine and all the posterity of generations that read and get their hands on this book. Living and active means that it speaks directly to our hearts. Remember Peter's Pentecost Day sermon? The book of Acts tells us that as Peter was preaching the word, they were cut to the heart. Think about that. Cut to the heart. So that as the Spirit moved upon them and within them, they were moved to repent. They were moved to commit their hearts to Christ. 3,000 people were added to the church in a single day. That's 10 times more than we have here on a Sunday morning in a single day. The living power of God's word is compared to many things in scripture, but one of the, the biggest, most important is the rain that falls from the sky. The rain that waters all the plants of the field, waters our crops, sustains every living being, including you and I. Remember these familiar words from Isaiah 55. I'll put this on the screen for you. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. My friend, God has great things that he wants to accomplish in your life. And the Bible will help bring those about. That's why I am very excited about how many of you signed up for the Jesus and You class here on Sunday evenings. Uh, I think we're up to 105 people. But we all need to be reading the word. We need to delight in the word, to love the word, to hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin, as scripture says. We need to accept what it says and trust what it says as true and right and good and reliable to guide our lives. We need to put our hope in its promises and to claim those promises when the dark times of life come. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of the word of God. For it is the power of God for everyone who believes. 
So the Bible is, and the Bible has the power of God himself to change your life and your situation and any situation in the world. The power of God unto salvation. Later in Romans, in chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, through the word of God. Now, our Hebrews text says that it's like a double-edged, a two-edged sword, which means that it has power to convict us. It has the power to lead us to repentance. It has the power to assure us, to strengthen us, to empower us to give us victory, to give us courage in our trials, to lead us back to God if we've fallen away. So how should we respond to the word of God? It's a key question. How should we respond? First of all, we should praise God for it. It is a matchless gift. Praise him for it. But then we should love the word. Above all other words, we should be eager to read it. We should become devoted students of the Word of God. And that leads me to say, I've said this before, but let me just put it out as a reminder. Would you bring your own Bible to church on Sundays? Let it be your companion when you come to church. I want us to take seriously being students of the Word of God and carry our books like students carry their books to school. I would suggest you could start this today, if you're not in the habit of doing it, that you take notes about what God is saying to you. What is he revealing to you? What is he teaching you? What is he convicting you about? There's a panel on the second um, page, the right-hand panel of the bulletin, where you can take notes. This is for your personal application, for you to receive the word and then do something with it. Don't be a hearer of the word only. Live the word. Bring your Bible. You say, Pastor Paul, why should I bother? Let me tell you why. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, implied the woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, you cannot be the godly person God wants you to be. You cannot do the godly things that God wants you to do without being in the word of God. Imagine me trying to do the job that I do without a Bible. You would say, well, that's natural, that's understandable for you. You're in a profession where it's needed. You are in a profession where it's needed. It really is no different for you, is it? We all need to use the Bible on our jobs. We need its counsel. We need its guidance. We need its instruction. We need everything the Word of God has for us every day, at work or home or otherwise. If I don't keep moving, I'm going to start preaching. Let's go on. Number two is faith. Since we're going to make a building here, let me put this on this side. Faith. Now we go to verses 1 and 2 of our text. Notice there's a direct connection between this pillar now and the one we just talked about, the Word of God. Verse 2 says, we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. Who's they? That's the ancient children of Israel. But the message they heard was of no value to them. What? The word of God was of no value to them? Why not? The writer goes on. Because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Combine it with faith. Why is faith so important? The writer to the Hebrews will go on in chapter 11, verse 6, to say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Jesus said to many of those who came to him for healing, according to your faith, it will be done to you. 
What if everything that happened in your life was done according to the measure and the level of your faith? How would your life be different? We're told that when Jesus was in his own hometown of Nazareth, that he could do no works of God there, no miraculous things, because of their lack of faith. Friends, faith is the primary hallmark of those who belong to God and who truly know God. But a lot of people confuse head knowledge with saving faith. They're far different. Saving faith is not merely believing in God. And there's a lot of people who confess to be Christians across the face of this country who do not really have saving faith. They believe about God. Even Satan and the demons, we're told, believe in God. That is, they believe that he exists. But they aren't going to be saved. Saving faith is also not temporal faith. That is the kind of faith when somebody looks up to God and prays and cries out for his help and says that they're going to follow God and obey him, and et cetera, because they're in big trouble. And as soon as the trouble is gone, they go back to life as it was before. Temporal faith. When scripture says the just, the righteous, shall live by faith, it means the only way that you can stand before a righteous and a holy God is to have an ongoing relationship of trust in him. That's what faith is, right? Trusting him for everything. We must take him at his word all the time and believe that every promise he has made will be true. Even when our natural reason, even when our human emotions might incline us to deny it or to think otherwise and to go our own way. I love an old gospel song, and some of you who love to sing probably know this song. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. So true. All right, well, let's keep moving. Uh, the third one is obedience. Obedience. Uh, and again, this one is connected to the other two that we've looked at, faith and the word of God as well. Verse 6 says that some of the Israelites who had the gospel preached to them did not go in, that is, did not go into the promised land because of what? Because of their disobedience. So living the Christian life, friends, is more than just about faith. It's also about obedience. What does James 2.17 say? Faith without works is dead. Dead. When we're out in the community, when we're out in our neighborhoods doing works of kindness and mercy and service for folks, what kind of a response does that elicit from them? Are they going to say, oh, that Forest Grove Reformed Church is really an obedient church? Or man, that person really is obedient. Not likely. It's more likely that they're going to say, that church over there really demonstrates faith. Real faith. That person shows what true Christian faith is about. That's why James says, I will show you my faith by what I do. Paul said in Galatians 5, 6, we'll put this up on the screen. I think we have it. Yes. The only thing that counts is faith doing what? Expressing itself. Through love. Folks, the world, people, can't see our faith. All they can see is our love and our obedience. God wants to see that too. As proof, living proof, of the genuineness of our faith. God was so exasperated, so disgusted so frustrated, so angry with the children of Israel because they did not walk in obedience to him in the, the wilderness wandering 
that he actually denied them the privilege, the joy, the blessing of going into the promised land with Joshua. So I cannot overstate the importance of living out our confession by works of obedience to the Lord. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So in every possible way, we should want to be a people. We should want to be a congregation that obeys the Lord. That we don't fall away because of our disobedience. We need to keep coming back to these fundamentals of what God has said he expects, he desires, he wills for his people. There's no substitute for obedience. Okay, last, last one. Prayer. Now, if, if all of the other ones that we've talked about this morning weren't so important, I would be tempted to say that I've saved the best for last. But they're all so crucial. But many of you know me well enough by now to know that I would love to talk about prayer every single Sunday in 2018. I'm not going to do that. I will occasionally preach or teach on prayer because I believe that prayer is one of the most important things in our life together. Prayer, to me, is the key that unlocks the power of God. It is the key that unlocks the glory of God in the midst of his people and in, in our own hearts. Brings us the peace of God. I said to my Sunday school class, which is a study of prayer right now, Jim Cimbala's, uh, one of his studies on prayer, that prayer is our relationship to God. It's not one just dimension of it. It's the relationship. If I want to have a relationship with my wife or with my daughters or with anybody else, I have to speak and I have to listen. Right? We all understand that there, if, if there's going to be a relationship at all, there has to be communication between the parties involved, and that communication needs to grow and develop and to bring the relationship together. Verses 14 to 16 of our text gives us a great invitation to open wide the gates of communication with our Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us that we have a great high priest in heaven, and would you believe me when I tell you that we need one? Because look at verse 13, the preceding verse. Why do we need an intercessor? He says, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I don't know about you, but I would not want to stand before the throne of Almighty God without Jesus Christ as my defense attorney. Jesus makes a perfect advocate because he became one of us. He totally understands us. He sympathizes with us in every way, the text says. And in all of the trials, all of the temptations that we face, he knows, he gets it. He knows our weakness. And he loves us. And he can forgive us if we turn to him. So the scriptures say, pray without ceasing. They say, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God says to us here, come to my throne. Come before my throne with confidence. Maybe that word surprised you in that text. But with confidence, with boldness, some versions say, there to find what? Grace and mercy and the help you need. All the help you need is at the throne of God. Of course, he's God. But we need to petition the help. Jesus' invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 is, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Which brings us to the whole point 
of Hebrews chapter 4, God's rest. And let me take just a moment to kind of set up my little, my bed here. I'm going to make my bed, but I'm not going to lie in it. Got to have a pillow. All right. No blankie, but that's okay. We get the idea. I'm not going to have time to explain this whole concept fully today. It's a huge concept in the scriptures. But let me say that when we build our lives on the four pillars that we've talked about today, scripture, faith, obedience, and prayer, and when we do that in the church as well, build the church on those things, we will experience God's rest. We will experience a security, a peace, a quietness in our souls, in our fellowship, that no one and nothing can touch. It's like going to heaven before you die. Heaven is another picture, another symbol of God's rest, right? Because ultimately, the final rest for the people of God, of course, is standing in the presence of God, in the glory of God, where Heidi stands right now. She's in God's ultimate rest. But there is a spiritual rest. There is an emotional, a psychological, an intellectual, I could even say a physical rest now. Available now for all those who will enter in. It is available to each of us here today. And this is what I desire for each of us here today. This is what I want this church to experience today. No disunity, no strife, no division, no disharmony. Perfect rest. Because we're all walking according to these things. Psalm 62, 5 5 says, my soul finds rest in God alone. You can't get this anywhere else. I can't give it to you. Consistory can't give it to you. The RCA can't give it to you. Nobody can give it to us except God alone. For that to happen, each and every one of us must be walking according to the word of God, Walking in faith, trusting the Lord daily, walking in obedience to the Lord, and growing deeply in a life of prayer. Now, you simply cannot remove one of those pillars and expect to experience the depth of rest that God promises. Let's think about, let's look at what happens if you remove just one of these pillars. Okay, your life of prayer isn't so great. Would you lie on that bed? Thank you. I wouldn't either. Let's take the word of God out. Oh boy, we're in some big trouble now. This is not a good picture of a good night's rest. The same thing will happen to your life if you allow it to happen. And if you don't make it your life goal and purpose to do these four things that we've talked about this morning, we need to grow in all of these areas. I need to grow in these areas. I'm not exempt, Doug's not exempt, Todd's not exempt, none of us are exempt. So my question to you this morning is, where do you need the most help? If you had to identify just one of these areas, the word of God, faith, obedience, prayer, where would you say you need the most help? Just think about it. And think about this. The help that you need is right around you. The help that you need is right here in this church family. If you're struggling to be in the Word of God, join us for the Jesus in You class. One great way to start. We've got a lot of people there, but there's room for more. So come join us, 5.30 tonight. There are small groups, Saturday Night Alive, other small groups, Sunday school, books in the library. Talk to Linda. She'll help you. Doug and I, Todd, we'll help you to get into the Word of God. 
Or let's say you're struggling with some private area of disobedience in your life and you can't conquer it, right? You've tried to beat this thing for years and you can't. You have wonderful elders here. You have precious saints of the Lord. You have pastors who are ready and willing to sit down with you and encourage you and support you and hold you accountable or whatever, pray with you, whatever it is you need to be victorious, to be a conqueror over this, that Satan would no longer hold you in bondage and hold you down from living the abundant life that God wants for you. You just have to seek it. It's right here. And if you need help with prayer, then come and join the prayer team when we're, when we're gathering. We're in the prayer room from 9.05 to 9.25 every Sunday morning. If you need prayer, come. We'll pray for you. If you want to learn how to pray, be with people who pray. It's not hard. It's just doing it. Now this. Wherever you might need help, I just want to urge you, don't settle. Don't settle for a weak, wobbly, unsteady Christian life that caves in under the weight and the pressure of the world. A lot of people do. They don't fight the good fight. They don't try to finish the race. They just cave in to the weight of the world. And they stop attending church and they put the Bible on the shelf and they don't bother to pray because they think it doesn't work. It works but it's a life of discipline, right? And you know what? God is there to give you the grace that you need. Listen, he's there to give you all the grace that you need to do and to be everything he wants you to do and to be. And you know what? You can't do it in your own strength anyway. You need the Lord. Trust the Lord. Rely on the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Some of you listening this morning have thought about these four things, or as you were hearing about these four things, you were thinking, I don't do that part very well. That's an area of weakness for me. That's a, that's a point of struggle for me. So this morning, if you want to get serious with the Lord, if you really want to do business with God here this morning, I want to invite you, if you're ready to do this, to just give this to the Lord and to say, Lord, I'm releasing this one to you. Whether it's your level of faith, it's your obedience in some private sin, if it's a lack of prayer, if it's whatever. Say, Lord, I, I give this to you and I ask you to help me. And our eyes are closed, so I'm just going to invite you I'm not even going to open my eyes. I'm going to just invite you that if you want to make that commitment to ask the Lord, to consecrate yourself to the Lord, to grow in this area, that he will grow you as you surrender this to him. Just raise your hand. Let the Lord see your hand. Just go ahead and put it up right now. Okay. Put them down. Now, there might be somebody else here this morning who's been listening to this and say, okay, it's all good. But you sense in your own heart that you don't even have the foundation. You don't even have the ground floor on which the pillars need to be built. You're outside of a real relationship of trusting and believing in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you need to take that step today. Because Christ alone is the cornerstone. He's the only one on which you can build a life for God or a life for yourself. And so your desire this morning, I pray, is that Jesus Christ would come into your heart and change you and make you a new person by the power of his Holy Spirit, just as he did with Peter and with the disciples, with Paul, and all those who are out throughout the ages who have given their hearts to Christ and lived for him and for his glory alone and not for themselves. Would you join yourself to that body of believers the true invisible church of Jesus Christ today. He's calling you. He's saying, come to me. Come before my throne. You'll find grace. You'll find mercy. You'll find forgiveness. You'll find love. You'll find all that you need to live for me. You cannot live this life for yourself, and you cannot live it alone. 
So your prayer this morning is, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn to you now. I confess that I believe that you are the Christ, the only Savior. And I pray that you would come into my life today and be the Lord of my life. And that you would take control of me. Give me your spirit. Lord, help me to walk in your ways. Give me a love for your word. Give me faith that I don't have of myself today. Give me the gift of faith. Help me to walk in obedience to you. I know that I can't do it apart from you. And help me to have a, a relationship of communication with you through prayer. Lord, I give you my heart today. Take me, I'm yours. I ask you to hear my prayer.